Hey, good afternoon to you. It is now 507 News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we are making sense of the news. You can join us today, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Kamala Harris has a lot to say about your guns and the protection of your family. Not a big fan. Assault weapons that are already in circulation. What do you do about those? If we have to have a buyback program, and I support a mandatory buyback program. There she was in 2019 when she last ran for president, saying that she supports what she refers to as a mandatory back buyback program that is literally gun confiscation from American citizens, a gross violation of the Second Amendment. Uh, last week in Wilmington, this is what she said. We'll finally pass red flag laws, universal background checks, and an assault weapons ban. She wants to ban the sale of the guns that are least used in violent crimes uh, in the country and most used for keeping people safe. Here's Kamala yesterday in Atlanta. We who believe in the freedom to live safe from gun violence will finally pass universal background checks, red flag laws, and an assault weapons ban. Her appetite for disarming you, not subsiding. Let's go to John Lott now, the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center and the author of Gun Control Myths. To dis uh, uh, join and he's joining us now. John, uh, great to have you back with us, sir. Oh, great to talk to you. Glad your phones are working. The phones are working. Now, uh, <laughs> give me give me a sense, and thank God for that. Um, give me a sense of what the left is getting wrong here, what Kamala in particular is getting wrong here about guns. Well, uh, you know, Biden has pr probably been, I don't think without question, uh, the most pro-gun control president that we've had. Uh, he's put thousands of gun dealers out of business. Uh, he's gone and put together a national gun registry. He's gone and uh, revived uh, Obama's Operation Choke Point, which has debanked uh, many uh, companies um, so they can't have financial uh, institutions working with them. But if anything, uh, Kamala Harris is well to the left of them. You know, when they were both running for president uh, for the 2020 election, uh, both of them supported uh, an assault weapons ban, but she supported a mandatory confiscation of the guns. Uh, and she went even further. Uh, she was saying that she thought that she could accomplish all that through executive order if she couldn't go and get uh, a, a bill passed through Congress. And, you know, it's even it's worse now even than it was before, because given that we have this national registry that the Biden administration has put together, they're going to have a pretty good idea of what guns different people own. And so uh, it's much easier for them to go and have uh, this mandatory confiscation than it would have been four years ago. Yeah. So tell me about the National Gun Registry. How did Biden stand it up? How is it different than what existed before? Well, uh, federal law uh, prevents the, the federal government from putting together a national gun registry. Uh, obviously, the Obama administration got caught a couple times keeping the records of all the background checks. They're supposed to destroy them after 24 hours after the background check has been completed. But uh, Biden has been too cute by half. They say, well, uh, the way they read the law is that they can't actually use a gun, national gun registry. And so what they've done is, as of about two years ago, there hasn't been any updates on this. They had computerized almost a billion transactions for guns over many decades. Uh, and they said, well, as long as we have it computerized but don't actually use the data files that are there, then you know we're within the scope of the law. But you'll hear things like, Bank of America turning over credit card records to uh, to the Department of Justice for yeah. people who use their Bank of America. The reason why they're doing that is to go and help put this registry together well, that they have. The the idea uh, the idea that they don't have ready access to a registry I've always thought was absurd. I mean, look what happened just a couple of weeks ago. Thomas Crooks gets on that roof, he takes a couple shots at Trump, and and thankfully misses him, but he does murder another man in the crowd, wounds two others. Right. Uh, obviously, he hit Trump, wounded him uh, in his ear. That, that goes without saying. Um, but they identified him within like four minutes. 
because they just looked at the the gun and they said, oh, that belonged to his dad. The government knew that instantly because they keep a registry. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, they can go to the people that, uh, you know, sold the gun and they have records of who sold what guns. And it's been possible for them to for decades to go and check these things. This just make it easier for them to do it. And also, it's the reason why they push things like universal background checks and that you heard uh, Harris talk about a couple of times in those clips. You know, they go and they say that the reason why they want uh, these universal background checks is so that they can go and solve crimes. And that's simply not a serious comment that's there. Uh, we've had registration and licensing in Hawaii since 1960. We've yeah. had it in New York and Maryland and uh, Chicago and Washington, D.C. And yet those jurisdictions can't even point to one crime that they've been able to actually solve despite spending huge resources on setting up the licensing and registration systems. And you, you know, and there's a simple reason for that. In theory, if you have a criminal commit a crime with a gun and it's registered to the criminal and he leaves the gun at the crime scene, then in theory, you can trace it back to the criminal. But as in the case of Crook, you know, if somebody almost, they almost never leave the gun at the crime scene. When they do, it's because the criminal's either been killed, as in Crook's case, or seriously wounded, so you've caught them anyway. Or uh, if the gun is left there, it's because, uh, you know, it's not registered to the criminal. And the once or twice that it is uh, registered, it's not registered to the person who committed the crime. And so, you know, but the only reason why you have these universal background checks in this national gun registry is to confiscate the guns at some point. Yes. It's not something, you know, you know, except for TV shows like Law and Order, it's not actually something that's used to solve crimes. No, it's a, it's the federal government's way of gathering intel on potential adversaries, i.e. the American public. That's uh, that's why— Well, that's law-abiding, why... law-abiding American public, that's who they, they have the registry list yeah. for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for sure. Um, these uh, can you can you address the the, the myths, the, the lies about background checks? I uh, from Kamala Harris, I, I feel like I've heard her say maybe within the last week. Uh, but regardless, the left says this all the time. They suggest that there's something called a gun show loophole, that gun dealers are going to uh, gun shows and selling guns to American citizens without conducting uh, a federally mandated background check. Um, what's the truth there? I mean, she's made that statement explicitly many times over just the last couple of years. She claims that licensed gun dealers, when they go to gun shows, don't have to go and do a background check. And so that's what they want to try to close. But anybody who knows anything about the law knows that a, a, gun, a licensed gun dealer, whether they sell a gun at their store or they sell a gun at a gun show or they sell a gun any place, has to go and do a background check on it. And uh, so, you know, it's a nice talking point on them. What they really want to do is to make it so that all transfers, if you transfer a gun to a cousin or a relative or somebody like that, to try to make them go through a background check. And one thing that's not getting a lot of attention is she's essentially been the gar gun control czar in the, in the Biden administration. Uh, when they set up this Office of Gun Violence Prevention uh, that was there, Biden put out a statement saying that Kamala Harris was going to be the one who was going to be overseeing the operations uh, for that. And, uh, uh, and they were involved in putting out these new ATF regulations that essentially defines virtually everybody as a firearms dealer. If you sell one gun and even talk to somebody else about selling you another gun, even if you don't sell it, you need to be a licensed firearms dealer. If you sell one gun and keep the records of how much you got, it, you sold it for and what you paid for it, even if it's just one gun, you have to be a licensed firearms dealer. Uh, and then they have all sorts of vague things there that basically say they'll know you're a licensed dealer when they see it, but they're not going to tell you specifically about all the rules that you might have to follow mm -hmm. to make sure you don't violate the, the law on that. And, and so, but the reason, go ahead. Sorry, finish your thought. No, the reason why they're doing this, obviously, is to 
helped finish put together this national gun registry that's there. So uh, in her time as gun czar, uh, has she um, has she made it so that fewer people die uh, by guns? Has she succeeded <laughs> in that mission? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know, you and I can go and talk about the errors in the FBI data on mm-hmm. this stuff. But if you look at the Centers for Disease Control uh, data on uh, what you find is that homicides and homicides minus legal intervention have, are both higher in 2022, the last year that they're available for, than they were in 2020, the last year of the uh, Trump administration. And, uh, and much higher than they were prior to prior to then, 2019 or, mm-hmm. or earlier. So, yeah, I don't think they they've been successful. And, and all those that. gun deaths are but, they are they result of an AR-15? Right. I mean, you made a com- correct comment on this earlier. If you look at all murders, uh, any rifle of any type, and obviously AR-15s are just a portion of that account for about 2.8% of all murders in the United States. You have more people who are murdered with hands and fists. You have more people who are murdered with cutting instruments than you have murdered with any type of rifle in the United States. So, you know, just as a, one thing I do want to bring up, one thing that she's pushed hard and that her Office of Gun Violence Prevention uh, has like as its top or one of its couple top things that they want to accomplish is changing the liability rules so that gun makers and gun sellers are liable for any harm that occurs with a gun. So they want to, you know, Biden and Kamala Harris say, you know, gun makers and gun sellers can't be sued. That's false. If you sell a defective gun, uh, you can get sued. If you break the law in selling a gun so as you don't go and do the background check or you don't do it uh, correctly, uh, and somebody goes and commits a crime, mm-hmm. you will get sued. Uh, what they want to do is make it so that if somebody, you know, you do a background check properly and, and the person goes and does anything bad with the gun, you should be liable. Can you imagine if we applied that to cars, you know, so that if somebody isn't paying attention when they're driving, should Ford be liable for all the medical costs, for all the uh, you know, lost wages for all the pain and suffering for all the health care costs that are there uh, as a result. I mean, what would happen to the car industry if they were liable for all those things? It probably put a lot of the car companies out of business. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We have like we have over five million people a year in the United States who are injured in car accidents. Yeah, there's the, so, the left has an appetite for this, though. I mean, like cars, as an example, you know, remember the city of Chicago sued the car companies Kia and Hyundai, uh, claiming that they were right. responsible for all the carjackings in the city because they didn't do enough to prevent carjackings. It's like they're, they make car they make cars. That's their job. Your job is to stop the criminals from stealing them, uh, and the city tried to pass the buck on to Kia and Hyundai. So th- there's an appetite on the left to do this. So well, it's going to be some car that's going to be the most stolen. Uh, you know, maybe they need to make cars that aren't attractive, so nobody wants to own them or <laughs> or, or possess them. They're working on it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Lastly, uh, John Lott, uh, I, there was a moment in that audio, and and I played several clips of Kamala talking about how she wants a, a so-called assault weapons ban again. We have tried this in the United States, which she's talking about. It started in 1994 and it concluded in 2004. What did the data show about uh, crimes committed with guns during that time? Well, if you look at for any type of rifle, you actually saw uh, the number of uh, crimes when the assault weapons ban sunset in 2004. Actually, the share of murders with rifles actually fell after that. If you if you look at so-called mass public shootings that are there, uh, what you find is no matter what database you use for for measuring those things, when the assault weapons ban uh, sunset, the percentage of, of mass public shootings using assault weapons actually declined, uh, which, you know, and, and I would argue during the ban itself, it actually went up the percentage of, sh- of mass public shootings using assault weapons actually rose when the ban was in place there. But, you know, it's, uh, eh. You know, people can find the data at our website at crimeresearch.org. We have 
Excel files that people can download and look at each of the cases that are there. But you know, the, the Biden administration and Biden often will make the opposite claim. Democrats will make the claim. It's based on data from one researcher, yeah. uh, uh, Louis Clarivas, uh, from the Teachers College at Columbia. And he has his own kind of unique definition of, of what's a mass public shooting. Right. But even if you take his numbers, the share of attacks with assault weapons fell after this uh, after 2004 when it sunset so you can't argue that that's driving more attacks if you have even a greater number of attacks with non-assault weapons that are occurring after yes. that period yes and you're you're using the government's definition of assault weapon uh but it, it's just it's just wild and, and notice they always say assault weapons meaning they're going after rifles and law-abiding citizens they never say we need a handgun right. ban for, it's like why what what is this um at any rate, well, Ma Massachusetts just uh, signed a law this week that would ban essentially any semi-automatic firearm that can hold a detachable magazine that can hold that is capable of holding more than ten bullets. Huh. And so they've they've effectively banned virtually all semi-automatic guns if the courts were to uphold. Is that true for government officials? Can cops have those guns? <laughs> I, I didn't see it. I, I read the bill. It's like 160 pages, yeah. uh, 116 pages. But uh, I don't. I didn't see any exemption for police officers. I bet you. I, I bet you be they can. Yeah, yeah. I bet yeah. you. It always works that way, right? The government gets to have uh, better arms than the people. Um, okay. Thank you very much, uh, John Lott. As always, sir. Good to talk to you. Hey. Good afternoon to you. 5:36 here. News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. A couple of things I want to get to this half hour, including a new video is out of July 13th uh, when President Trump was shot uh, and just how long law enforcement had a clear indication that there was a man on the roof. I'll get to that. Also, uh, some new details about Joe Biden's senility coming out a uh, U.S. senator sharing a never-before-heard story. Uh, got, I've got that audio. Uh, but first, uh, we do go back to the phones. I've got John calling in from Kensington, Kensington now on line three. John, good afternoon, sir. You're on the Vince Colonnais Show. Hi, thank you, Vince. Yes, sir. I am just going to say, I, I watched that um, Trump interview by Rachel Scott. Um, she should be fired, not so much for her bias, but more she was just incompetent. I mean, tr Trump took her out to lunch mm -hmm. during that mm -hmm. interview. He, he just was constantly making points over her and talking around her, answering the questions, I think. But she she, she was just in another league. Yeah, she was something else. Uh, so what John's talking about is Rachel Scott of ABC News. Uh, President Trump just did an interview with the National Association of Black Journalists. There were three reporters on that stage, one from Semaphore. Rachel was there. Uh, and also Harris Faulkner of the Fox News Channel was also on that stage. But Rachel was just nasty. And she was um, she was just really it wasn't simple. She wasn't even really basing any of her questions on any meaningful facts. She was just regurgitating left wing talking points, including any number of hoaxes. And Trump, he really just dressed her down, didn't he, John? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you, so do you think so? The left right now is celebrating Rachel Scott. They're saying that. She did a wonderful job. They're 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 cheerleading her right now. Uh, how do you think it really went? Oh, I mean, Trump was, you know, she would say, "Well, we have to move on," and Trump immediately came right back and said, "Well, you're the one who who started this meeting 35 minutes late." I mean, he he was just nonstop. He he beat her every time and more. Yeah, I I think you're right. Yeah, he uh. He's got he, he's got a lot of training in this. Uh, he's he's very used to this format, which is like he's going to get treated poorly. So he better call it out as it's happening and, and fight back. And and he keeps doing it. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, I, I think you're totally right. I think Rachel Scott embarrassed herself today. Uh, I wasn't I don't know if I was all that familiar with her with her uh, shtick. Not impressed by it, though. Not it was not particularly good. Uh, let us see here. Uh, I've got Roger calling in from Manassas, line four. Roger, good afternoon, sir. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Good afternoon, Vince. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. Um, 
I was sitting there thinking about you know that assault weapons ban, mm-hmm. and I told the call screener, well, an assault weapon is basically anything that you use to commit a, uh, a felony assault. You know, it could be anything from a wrench out of my toolbox to a golf club to um, a baseball bat. You know, you name it. Yeah. You know, you use that to do, do the crime. Well, that would be the assault weapon. That's right. Yeah, or a car. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And also, like, years ago, I sold a forty four Magnum. I had a yard sale, and I sold it to a, some guy I don't even know. And I called the Virginia State Police and asked him, well, what, you know, how do I handle this? And they're nothing on the books. So if I were to sell you a gun privately, um, he recommended that I get all your driver's license information in case the weapon's ever used in a crime. Mm-hmm. Have a bill of sale. And yeah, some way to some way to track it backwards. Uh, yeah, but but look, the the reason that we have this system set up the way it is, which is is the government is not supposed to be involved in this. The the the, the 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 operating presumption is that it's the American people who are in charge of our system, not that the, it's the government. We don't need Dad's permission uh, in order to uh, sell or, or buy guns from one another. Uh, as it exists right now, it's. Those people who are in, in the business of selling firearms, dealers, like if they actually generate revenue because this is their business, they turn profits. Those are the people who have to conduct these background checks. In other words, there is no gun show loophole for background checks. It's a lie. Nope. If, if you're a gun dealer selling at a gun show, if you're a gun buyer, mm-hmm. if you've ever gone to a gun show, the most annoying part of buying the gun is you have to sit there and wait for the background check to be concluded. Yep. And that's like, you know, at a gun show, it's just like going to, like, any brick-and-mortar gun shop. You know, you have to do the same thing there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's just easier to it's easier to window shop because there's so many other dealers there. <laughs> you, could, you could check on all the stuff. Especially him and Ashton. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a good – it's a fun time, actually, going down to the gun show. Thank you, uh, Roger. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Assault weapon is a, a nebulous term. What they really mean is um, semi-automatic rifles that law-abiding citizens use. They'd like to ban those. Uh, they, they they don't want you to have them uh, at all. Uh, let's see. Phil is calling in from Fredericksburg, line two. Phil, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colonnais Show. Hey, look, I was driving to work, and I was listening to WMAL, and it went to news break, and then it, it brought up the report that Israel had killed one terrorist leader, and then it brought up the report that Israel had killed the leader of Hamas. Yeah, yeah. And I could not believe how wonderful that felt because— if you know what he stands for, you know this guy needed to be driven into the ground a long time ago. He's actually a modern version of Adolf Hitler. They killed two modern versions of Adolf Hitler yesterday. And I'm so happy for Israel and for the IDF. I'm so glad. This is what happens when you don't have a rotten bag of cabbage head in as your leader. This is what happens when you have a, a vibrant, responsible leader who protects his people. You yeah, know? they they put a they uh, had a targeted strike. Apparently, they put I guess they put a missile right on his his uh, couch or something uh, because they they whacked this guy and uh, uh, he's gone. Uh, it, Iran is promising retaliation. Uh, they they often promise retaliation. Uh, we'll see where it goes from here. But but Phil, God, you're God you're right. The the, the the right person was delivered to hell. You're right about that. There you go. Thank you, Vince. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for the call. Yep. Um, let me uh, let me turn now to uh, some of this audio I've got for you. Uh, We've got uh, first and foremost the, the video. I, I uh, there's some new video being shared today by uh, Fox News um, that shows it was obtained by Fox News Digital. That's what, at least what it says on their, um, you know, the the little watermark that's put on the video. It's uh, the video is not tremendously long. There's there's not much to it, and and it's it's not of much use for me to play it on on air. Other than to say this, in the video, it's the perspective from the stands. Uh, really right in the vicinity of where everyone was being shot. Uh, They're on the opposite side of Trump, so away from the shooter. Uh, And they're looking across Trump. Like, so so you know how Trump was looking to the right and looking up at that screen? You're behind him in this video. You're behind him as he makes that look. So on the roof of the AGR building, which is where Thomas Crooks was, the assassin, minutes before the shooting began, you see Thomas Crooks just walking on the roof. In fact, I uh, went back, I checked the audio against the original speech just to see um, 
how long before this was captured. And it, it was two minutes and 57 seconds exactly. That's the first time, at least in the in the footage we are now seeing today. Thomas Crook's head and shoulders, enough body pops up that any Secret Service agent who's scanning the horizon or a building is looking around is going to see this guy. It was captured clearly on this camera from the perspective of someone sitting in the stands. And he's just walking around on the roof. That's three minutes prior, two minutes and 57 seconds prior to the shots ringing out. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy to see this. Horrifying to see it. And to hear the Secret Service again this week saying that, no, nobody's been placed on administrative leave. We're not, we haven't suspended anyone pending the results of an investigation. So what are you telling me? That these guys are all going to continue to be involved in making security decisions for protectees, in particular for Donald Trump? That is in every possible way unacceptable. Suspend everybody who was involved in the security decisions for that day. Suspend them all. Pending the results of an investigation. And if you conclude that they're not guilty of anything, that it was somebody else, fine. But in the meantime, what? 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 So three minutes, you can check it out. It's on my X feed today. Uh, Two minutes and 57 seconds before Crooks even starts shooting. I've also included the original source video in the thread. Uh, You can can pan right to it. It's four minutes and three seconds into that video uh, where you can see uh, Trump saying the same exact remarks you hear as uh, as we see in this new footage uh, where Thomas Crooks is is literally just walking all over the top of the AGR building. Uh, And uh, he... Got to keep doing that for three minutes straight until he started opening fire. So there's uh, a that, that's that's what's going on there. Uh, meanwhile, I've got new audio too of uh, of another story never been told in public before of Joe Biden's brain ceasing to operate as he was interacting with people. In this case, it was the wives of United States senators. Senator Mike Lee was on Tucker Carlson's uh, leading podcast this week. And uh, Mike Lee told Tucker uh, about the difference in working with various presidents. He's he's had a chance to work with a couple of presidents. And he said Obama and Trump, very active presidents of the United States, would work uh, very closely with the United States Senate. Not so much with Biden. In fact, uh, it's even worse than that. There's one time in particular, I remember walking in the basement of the Capitol. I was turning a corner and bumped right into President Obama. And we had a great little chat. Oh, Mike, yeah, good to see you. Let's talk soon about criminal justice reform. It's it great. We'd run into him. Uh, he would call from time to time just to check in on things that we agreed on, projects that we were working on together. Um, Trump, of course, was very active. Um, members of Congress could call him and get him on the phone very, very quickly. He was very engaging. With Biden, it hardly happens at all. Really? Like they shielded him from us. Um, in some ways, uh, my, my, my wife, I think this was in maybe the first half or the first quarter of 2022, went over to an event at the White House for Senate spouses hosted by uh, the first lady who was herself a, you know, longtime member of the Senate spouses organization. And while they were there, President Biden just kind of came wandering in. I think they were in one of the ballrooms kind of came wandering in. She said there there was no secret service with him, no staff with him. He just kind of walked in. She she said instinctively, I just said, oh, hello, Mr. President. It's good to see you. He asked her, do you work in the East Wing? And she said, no, no, Mr. President, I'm I'm Sharon, Sharon Lee, uh, uh, Senator Mike Lee's wife. Uh, you, You know, he swore me into the Senate twice, first in 2011, then in 2017, just before he left the vice presidency. And we had interacted with him a lot, and she thought that would t- take care of it. He looked confused, and moments later, he said, do you work in the West Wing? And he was not quite there. Now, this was a couple years back. He, he says to the same woman, he's, as he's speaking to her, do you work in the East Wing? No, I'm Senator Mike Lee's wife. Oh. Do you work in the West Wing? <laughs> no, I don't. But I believe we've already addressed this. Like, mere moments ago, uh, he goes on here to say, that another Senate spouse walks up, the wife of a Democrat, uh, and tries to get Joe Biden to say happy birthday to her brother-in-law on the phone. And it's a total disaster. Moments later, whoa, moments later, someone came up uh, to him, uh, one of the other Senate spouses, I think it was a Democrat, and had a phone in her hand and said, hey, my 
brother-in-law is a big fan. It's his birthday. Uh, we would say hi to him. This is Biden's signature move. This is, he's really, really good at this. I remember when I first came to the Senate and he would have dinner and other gatherings with senators. He, he got Pat Toomey's dad on the phone when he found out oh, he had yeah. lived in Scranton and he was like, yeah, how the hell are you? This is Joe Biden. I understand you're from Scranton. By the end of it, Pat Toomey's dad and, and then Vice President Biden felt like they were old fraternity Totally. Brothers. I knew Biden, and, and I remember exactly Very that. good at this. Oh, excellent. But this woman handed him the phone. It rang. The woman's brother-in-law answered, hello. And then he got a confused look on his face, held out the phone, hung it up, and handed the phone back. Now, that for Joe Biden That's crazy. is very significant. Very significant. And this is sitting president. Yeah, and this is a couple years ago. So, and, and of course, everybody knew. Everybody knew all along uh, what was going on here. Uh, those of us on the American right uh, had pretty clear suspicions based on all of the publicly available information, which is why uh, most of my conservative friends, you talk to them about that debate performance, they're not really shocked by it because they all kind of thought, well, yeah, that's, that's who he is. That's what he's like. But boy, there were a lot of lefties who were stunned. What? What? Rachel Maddow lied to me? That's actually, that's not the takeaway they had. They just, they thought it was a sudden uh, declination. It was like, oh my goodness, look at him. He's really slipped in the last 24 hours. <laughs> like, there's no, you know, nobody went back and they're like, boy, Rachel Maddow was lying to me the whole time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop watching that network. No, that's not the lesson. They didn't walk away. They're like, ah, oh, crap, our power is on the line and he doesn't look very good. Who else can we replace him with? Kamala. It's 5.51 now. Hi, Vince. Thank you. Uh, I watched the... The president, former President Trump, talked yep. to black journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched the entire program, and um, there were two journalists on the stage with him who were relatively um, hostile, and another wasn't. I believe she was with Fox. Yep, Harris Fox. The point I wanted to make was that he, when he talks about immigration, illegal immigration, mm -hmm. the dangers it's bringing. He keeps sliding in this to the same phraseology. They're from an insane asylums. They're from mental institutions. One phrase always follows the other. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like he's, he's got these talking points. And what I'd like him to see, hear him, and I would advise him, was to take, take someone, a story, mm -hmm. an anecdote of someone who was victimized uh, and there have been some who are prominent in the news. Yes. Women who have been raped. And, and, but I felt that uh, I feel he can improve on it. Although I have to say, seeing him in all these rallies, you know his, his spiel. But we shouldn't know his spiel. You know what I mean? Well, you know, like anybody, when you, you get used to conveying something, you start to develop grooves in your brain you, and you use some of those talking points to similar places. But you're right. Uh, it is good to bring up the victims of all of this so that you put a you put a name to this problem. Jocelyn Nungare, a 12 year old raped and killed in Texas. Uh, we need to lift these names up and let the people know you're right about that. Thank you, Andrew. The great one. Mark Levin up next.